Tonight we discuss a subject which uh, occupies a great deal of thought in the minds of men in the church, university, wherever you may find it, the marketplace. People are always asking questions along this line. Namely, if God is good and if God is just, then how in the world do we explain the existence of evil? How do we explain the problem of pain and suffering? How do we come to grips with a world which quite obviously is dominated not by good, but by forces which are quite the opposite? And I think the Christian simply has to wake up to the fact that this is the type of problem that can't be swept under the rug, that can't be just given a one-sentence answer uh, punctuated with two or three Bible verses, Old and New Testament, and then abandoned as if the whole argument had been solved. The origin of evil is not an easy problem, and the dealing with evil is not an easy problem. And if you simplify either one, you're really not coming to grips with reality. So what we're going to try and do in the time we have together this evening is to discuss the problem of evil, to discuss where it came from, to put in perspective some of the things which we hear out in the street and in school, and then try and weigh all of this in the light of biblical theology so that we have a cohesive idea of how to effectively present the claims of Christ and of Christianity. In order to do that, we have to begin with a few definitions, because if we don't, we're going to be lost in a hopeless morass of argumentation and semantics. We'll be in the semantic jungle and we'll never get out of it. So what we want to do is to define a few terms. First of all, the term omnipotence has to be defined as quickly as possible. What do we mean when we talk about omnipotence? Well, the Latin from which it comes simply means all-powerful. So when we use the word omnipotent, we are talking about all power. So when we say that God has as one of his primary attributes omnipotence, we are talking about all power being vested in God. It is extremely important at this juncture that you understand that all power does not mean the capacity to do anything that the person who possesses it chooses. And that's a very important point, and it has to be understood. The fact that you possess omnipotence does not guarantee the capacity to do anything that you want. You say, well, goodness, I mean, after all, God is omnipotent, and he can do anything that he wants to do. There's nothing that God cannot do. That is not the truth. And the Christian walks right into it every time when the Christian confuses omnipotence in definition. So when we look at it and somebody says, do you believe God is omnipotent? You say, yes. And they say, well, how can an omnipotent God who's all-powerful allow evil to go on in the world? How could he have ever permitted it to take place to begin with? Then the Christian, of course, has to go into definitions and has to come up with reasonable and viable answers. Now, I must reiterate this as I have in every lecture, that it is incumbent upon the church of Jesus Christ, it is mandatory for the church of Christ, to give answers and reasons for faith. You simply can't dismiss it. You have to deal with it. And if you don't deal with it, then the world considers your silence as evidence that their position is correct. Therefore, you have to speak. Christ spoke out against the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the Herodians. The apostles debated in the marketplace the viability of Christianity. The early Christians were people who stood up for what they believed in, and they gave reasons for their faith. When old Peter said, to every man an answer, a reason for the hope that lies within you, he did it, and he led the early church to do precisely the same thing. So when we get to the definition of terms, let's be careful of the word omnipotent because it's crucial to the understanding of the problem of evil. 
Omnipotence means all power, but not necessarily the capacity to do anything that you want to do. I'm sure you've been in school and heard a teacher at one time or other say, well now, can God create a rock so big he can't lift it? There are variations of the chestnut, but that's the chestnut. And of course, the Christian thinks for a second and says, well, God is all-powerful. Obviously, he could do anything, and therefore he could create a very, very big rock. But something doesn't really compute at that point, because you have to ask yourself the question, if he's able to make it that big, is he able to control it? And if he can't control it, is he still omnipotent? And then you start chasing your logical tail around the mulberry bush, much to the joy of the people who have given you the problem. So let's face it for what it is. There are things God, though omnipotent, cannot do. And these are things which are contrary to his revealed nature. In other words, God cannot lie. The scripture says, God cannot lie. It is impossible for God to lie. Hebrews 6, 18. It is impossible for God to do something in eternity and then contradict it in time. It is impossible for God to fail. There are at least 14 or 15 things, and we don't have the time to go through a whole list of them, which the scripture lists for us, and your concordance will rapidly reveal where they are, that teach that God cannot do these specific things, that God cannot, not will not, cannot. And the reason is that his nature forbids him to do so. God cannot countenance sin. He cannot, because he is holy. But most of all, let's understand that there are limitations and the limitation is imposed by God's character, by God's nature. In other words, when God says that he loved the world and sent Jesus Christ into it to save it, he really means that. He's not talking out of one side of his mouth to one school of theologians and on the other side of his mouth to another school of theologians. He is talking to the whole world and he is saying that he sent Jesus Christ into the world to redeem us. God will not revoke his gifts. God will not change his salvation. In other words, there are things that God cannot do because his nature will not permit him to do so. One is to lie, and the other is to create something beyond his power to control. Therefore, he will never make a rock so big that he can't lift it because it would violate his nature. So rather than chase your tail around, simply go to the nature of God. And the answer becomes immediately clear. So as we face the problem of evil, let's understand the definition of omnipotence. I take the time to spell this out because there seems to be a conflict between omnipotence and the existence of evil. There really is no conflict once we understand the nature of omnipotence. Now the argument against God's beneficent and loving care for the world the argument that's always placed could be stated in about, I would say, eight or ten different forms. I have a, a logic book at home and also a number of philosophy books in the library where this argument is stated and restated multiple times. But in order to eliminate a great deal of the confusion, let's put it in everyday street language so that we'll grasp it immediately. What do you do with a person who says, and this you get on every level, no matter what you're on. If a beneficent, eternal, and omnipotent God exists, he could annihilate evil at will and end all pain and suffering. That's perfectly true. Absolutely true. Nobody can question that because it's accurate. Secondly, a being who had the power to do this would be cruel and unjust not to exercise it and thus end all evil and its consequences. 
Thirdly, theism, or the belief in one God, Christianity being theistic, affirms the omnipotent, beneficent God we have just described, who nevertheless does not annihilate evil. Therefore, he is cruel and he is unjust. Now, as I said, there are many refinements of the argument, but that's it in a nutshell. And the Christian goes back and forth between the syllogisms and the structures and the premises, and pretty much like a tennis game, trying to find an answer to it. I think that the answer can be had if we examine each one and then look at it in the light of divine revelation. We've already seen that the first premise is perfectly correct, that if a beneficent, omnipotent God exists, he could annihilate evil at will, and he could end all pain and suffering any time that he chose. Secondly, a being who had the power to do this would be cruel and unjust not to exercise it, and thus end all evil and its consequences. Here is the rub at that particular point, because it's being affirmed that the only way for God to be just and beneficent is for him to annihilate his opposite, which is evil, which one, places a restriction on the nature of God, and two, presupposes that our reasoning processes are equal or superior to his, so that our solution to the problem must automatically be God's solution. And third, and it should not be neglected, what really happens when you start applying this line of reasoning practically? Well, I had an illustration of this take place one night when I was on the Long John Nebel show in New York, and uh, I had a, lo a number of friendly people on with me that night. I had a rabbi, an atheist, an agnostic, a skeptic, and somebody I never did find out what they believed. <laughs> and we got into the subject of God's sovereignty. Our subject that night happened to be you know, the Bible and religion. Inevitably, we always get to the chestnuts, and these are old chestnuts. Namely, where did evil come from, and what about God being responsible for it? And, oh, on and on and on the discussion went. And finally, the chief antagonist was a highly educated atheist. And he had some pretty good arguments, and he was zinging them in there every chance that he could. And as I was listening to him, I thought to myself, there's only one way to really get to this joker, and that is to let him be in the position of solving the problems that he thinks God ought to solve. So as he was talking, I said, listen, I'd like to try a little experiment if we could. He said, what's the experiment? I said, you seem to be very disenchanted with the way God has worked things out. He said, well, if he exists, yes. He said, but I, I think so. Yes, I would say that. And I said, well, then look. There's a clock up on the wall there. It's going to be 12.30 or so in a couple of minutes. I'll tell you what, at 12.30 exactly, 12.30 exactly, we are going to theoretically impute omnipotence to you. Has everybody agreed that Shep will be omnipotent at 12.30? So everybody sort of looked around. <laughs> they started to laugh, you know. And I said, well, I mean, this is a hypothetical case. I said, I want to put to the test the argument against God's omnipotence and against the problem of evil. And I said, I, I can think of no better way to do it than to put it in the hands of the man who says, in effect, that he can do a better job. Okay. Shep is infallible at 1230. Well, you know, an eerie silence dropped on that studio. We only had about 40 seconds to go, but you can hear a pin drop. And as soon as the second hand hit, and he was omnipotent, I said to him, <clears throat> A being who has the power to annihilate evil at will, and all pain and suffering, and reconstitute everything in a state of perfection, would be cruel and unjust not to exercise it, and thus end all evil and its consequences. Right? And he said, well, absolutely, yes, certainly. I said, fine, all right, you are now omnipotent. Do it. And he said, what do you mean, do it? I said, make the decree that at this instant all evil shall be annihilated. That's what you wanted. 
Chris thought for a moment and looked at me and says, you wouldn't ask me that unless there was something going on in the back of your head. <laughs> what is it getting me into? I said, well, we didn't give you omniscience, we only gave you omnipotence. <laughs> so therefore, I said, you're going to have to make the decision. Well, it bandied around the table for four or five minutes, on and off and back and forth, and finally we got back and I said, well, do you want to do it or don't you? He said, I'm suspicious. I said, all right, let me put it to you this way. I said, the moment you make a decree as an omnipotent being, such as you are now, theoretically, to end all evil and annihilate everything, I said, you must take into consideration that you must begin with evil wherever it may be. He said, right. I said, good, then you are no longer with us. And he blinked his eyes and I said, none of us are here. All beings who have the power to choose have within one thousandth of a second of your decree ceased to exist. If the only way to deal with evil is to annihilate it as an actual and a potential, then you annihilate its actual manifestation and you annihilate its potential manifestation. And the moment you do that, you have successfully annihilated the entire human race. He looked at me for a moment. He said, well, I wouldn't want to do that. I said, we're very happy about that. <laughs> Glad you don't want to wipe us all out. Well, all of a sudden, people began to sober up a little bit. And I said, you see what you're really trying to do? You're really failing to take into consideration that you're saying, in effect, to God, if I had the power... I could do it better than you can do it. But you've been given the power, hypothetically. And you can't do it. Therefore, let's go back and examine why God doesn't do it. Because he doesn't have that problem. He himself is infinitely righteous, holy, just, and good. He could annihilate, and he could still continue to exist. Therefore, what's really behind the whole thing? If a being has the power to exercise omnipotence, is it that being necessarily unjust and cruel because he doesn't do it? The answer of the philosopher and the theologian who disagrees is automatically, of course he's cruel and inhuman, therefore we've got to rethink the whole idea of God. Or perhaps there's something deeper than that. Perhaps... We are dealing with something beyond the normal questions concerning God's nature and character and what he will do in a given situation. Christianity affirms the omnipotent, beneficent God we have just mentioned. He nevertheless does not annihilate evil. Is he therefore cruel and unjust? It does not logically follow that he is. If it can be shown that there are reasons for the existence of evil and for its continuation. And at this juncture, the Christian can make his case by denying the second part of the syllogism and by saying it is not true that a being who has the power to annihilate evil would be cruel and unjust not to exercise it and thus end all evil, pain and its consequences. The Christian starts right there. Now, I take the trouble to sketch this because in most dialogues with people who are attacking the nature of God and omnipotence and the problem of evil, they totally ignore any of this material. They simply force you to discuss omnipotence versus evil. And if you try and discuss omnipotence versus evil without qualification, take it from me, you are one dead pigeon. And you will not get any place. Therefore, you have to set forth the proposition to them this way. One, either God is good and not all-powerful, or God is all-powerful and not good. Therefore, God, by definition, does not exist. You will get an immediate answer to that. Absolutely true. Either God is good and he's not all-powerful, or God is all-powerful and he's not good. So, since we have to talk about an infinite God, we only have one alternative left, 
atheism. What does the Christian say to this so-called formidable argument? Answer. Suppose an almighty deity decides to allow free moral choice in his creation so that spirits and men may be truly free to love him rather than robots who reflect only his will by being programmed to respond to his stimuli. If this is true, and if we grant this, then such a being is neither cruel nor unjust, but infinitely wise. It is declared of the God of the Bible that this is precisely what he did, that God created freedom and moral choice, and that in doing this, the exercise of free will against him brought into existence what you and I know today as evil. No one has enough information to solve the riddles of theodicy or the problems of evil in relationship to God. But we do have enough information about God to know that he did not make the human race as robots. He made us as free agents to respond. Adam in the garden did not have to eat the fruit. Eve in the garden did not have to listen to whoever the conversationalist was. We know it was the devil using some form. And Satan himself before he fell, is described as finitely perfect and that the power of choice rested with him, that he could have bowed to God and served him forever, and the choice of evil would never have occurred. Now what does the Christian do when faced with the problem of evil? The Christian has to answer it by saying, that simply because God is omnipotent does not mean that he is compelled to exercise that omnipotence and by its exercise annihilate anything. He has the option of working out any solution to the problem that he chooses. And his solution renders him righteous and holy and just, not cruel and unjust. What men do, and note this, when they deal with the problem of evil, is to look at it, and while they're looking at it, select only that facet of the problem that will give them ground to attack the nature of God, and they pay no attention whatsoever to the other information. It's a selection of information, a selection of data. In the Soviet Union, you have Pravda and Tas, and you get selective information. If you come to your judgments on the basis of that, you will be intellectually locked off from the rest of the world. The same is true of the Chinese news agency. So therefore, it's a very simple thing to select data and to present what you want to present so that people will get only what you want to communicate to them. We see it on every side. Therefore, you begin with, if there's a beneficent being, and he's omnipotent, and if you see evil, and if you see uh, injustice in the world, and if you see cruelty, why, quite obviously, he can't be beneficent and kind and just. There's simply got to be a different idea of God. Now, at this juncture the Christian can really come through with some good information. And I think that the Christian has to recognize the fact that there are other solutions than the one I have just given. Edgar S. Brightman, who was a very brilliant philosopher at Boston University, Peter Bertocci, his successor, and another group of philosophers have held for a long time that the way you get around this problem is to say that God is not cruel and unjust at all because he's not omnipotent. 
He just really doesn't have the power to do the job. That's a quite interesting approach to the problem. In fact, Brightman presented a paper at the Philosophical Society on that ground, and this is how it went. We cannot blame God for inability to control evil simply because God himself doesn't have that kind of power. God has been working along with us to conquer evil, which is the opposite of his goodness. And as long as we cooperate with him and we work together shoulder to shoulder with God, inevitably we can help this finite God obliterate evil from his universe and we will get rid of the problem and be ultimately victorious. Now you might say, well, that's real weird. Well, that's real weird only if you believe in an infinite God. But you see, Brightman and a whole school of thinkers today don't believe in an infinite God. They believe in a finite God. And they propose this as a solution. Don't blame God. He's doing the best he can. That's the argument. Well, how does a Christian deal with this? Because it comes up inevitably. What do you do? Just ignore it and go back to your own and say, Oh no, we have an almighty deity who decides to allow moral choice and that solves our problem. You don't do that to a person who believes in a finite God because he believes that God allows moral choice too. How do you refute it? By this methodology. The universe is approximately 12 and a quarter billion years old. The God of creation has had a long, long time to deal with the problem of evil with infinitely more resources than we have at our command. If after 12 and a quarter billion years we're in the shape we're in now and the world is accelerating into multiple facets of evil far beyond anything we have known before, there are more people the multiplication of evil, therefore, is greater. How then can we ever hope in the future to overcome the problems that this God was unable to overcome in the past when they were only little problems? Now they're big ones. Once you've got a finite God, he's stuck in finite time. And if he's stuck in finite time, he's had a long time to clean up the mess, and he hasn't done very well. And if we pitch in and help him, we might manage a few more Dachau's, Auschwitz's, Belsons, and Buchenwald's, which indicates just how good we are at it as a race. Now, if we're going to really deal with the problem of evil, let's deal with it from the perspective of God, not from the perspective of men. What we've been doing here right now, for almost 35 minutes, I might add, is looking at it from the perspective of men. Let's look at it from the perspective of God. Now, the Scripture specifically tells us something about the character of God. We are told in Malachi chapter 3, I, the Lord thy God, I change not. We learn something else, too, about the character of God. And I think it's a good thing to consider the Scriptures and to have a good perspective on it, because if we do, then we learn something about him that will tell us how God deals with this problem and how he wants us to regard its solution. I'd like you to look at a couple of verses of Scripture which talk about God's character and how he wants us to regard him. Look first at Habakkuk 1, verse 13. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and you cannot look on iniquity. Here is the enunciation of what I spoke before. Here is something God cannot do. He cannot feast his eyes on evil because he is pure and he is holy. The solution is not instantaneous annihilation. The solution is from God's perspective to work it all out for his own glory and for man's redemption. It is no accident that Romans 8.28 remains one of the front pieces of divine revelation. King James Bible renders it incorrectly so far as the structure of Greek is concerned. 
It should read this way. For it is God who is working all things together for the end of good to those who are called according to his purpose. It's God who is doing it. In other words, what Paul is telling us, what the Scripture is telling us, is that God looks down on the evil which has come from free choice. And he says, I will not intervene in it except to exercise my free choice to cause the goals of evil to be turned to the ultimate glory of my purpose. Now we say, how does the Lord manage something like this? How is it possible for God, the almighty deity, to allow moral choice and then sin to come in in angels and men, let him, to let all of these things take place, how in the world does he maintain our freedom and his sovereignty? Well, a few years ago I was involved in computer technology involving information retrieval. That is getting something back out of the computer, which was meaningful, assuming, of course, that you had put something in in the first place. And in the work that we were doing at the time, and which we're still carrying on, this was something of great importance to us, and we felt that it would eventually help the church, and we still feel that this is the case. One of the things I learned when I was viewing computers is that they're idiots. No matter how big they are, no matter how sophisticated they may be, a computer is an extremely complex piece of machinery, and it thinks in terms that you and I don't understand thinking, but it is not thought original and transmitted, but thought which uh, involves a system of logic and mathematics which you and I will probably never be able to grasp. But it is not human thinking, it is not generative thinking as we understand it, conceptual thought. I learned something in my studies in computers. I must have had 20 interviews with specialists in the field of computer technology to understand the background of how computers retrieve information. One of the things that I learned and that taught me something about God from the computer, I want to pass on to you because it explains this problem of God's sovereignty and your freedom and mine. If you could imagine a computer that is absolutely infinite, it has a capacity that is unlimited. You could program into that computer every single human life from the first one to the last one. Every life that would interact with every other life. Every thought, every word, every deed. Every possible alternative of behavior. In effect, the totality of all knowledge of all events in all time periods from the beginning of time to the end. And every alternative to anything that anybody ever thought or chose. Perfectly interrelated. What would that computer be capable of doing? Let me tell you. It would be capable of a of permitting you to make any choice you wanted to make. But the moment you pulled your card, the computer would compensate for all the things which that card involved in your life so that you would be perfectly free to choose. But the programmer of the computer would already have figured out the way for him to have his free choice without interfering with yours. Result? You would be perfectly free to choose and the programmer would be perfectly free to make his decisions. The infinite computer is the mind of God. You and I have our lives in the cards and God has programmed it so that you are perfectly free to do what you want, but you are not free to alter those choices because he has the right of freedom to interfere and exercise his choice. 
So Jonah could be told to go to Nineveh, to use an old illustration. And Jonah pulled out his card and said, I am going to Tarshish on vacation, and left. You notice that no lightning bolt hit him between the land and the dock, that nothing interfered with him as he walked along the dock. Nothing occurred to him while the boat was tied up at the wharf. It's when they threw the lines over and set sail that the card came out. And then the programmer had the right to decide what he was going to do. And there was a storm, and there were lots, and there was wind, and there was a fish, and there was a wet prophet, <laughs> and, and there was somebody who was inside an overgrown sardine, and it just happened to be there out of all those millions of fish in the sea, and it just happened that by a free choice of his own will, he said, Help! <laughs> now go any place. Get me out of here, please. And the Lord said, I thought that you would come around to a reasonable position. <laughs> Even the fish was programmed for Nineveh. And sure enough, it took the fish three days to get there. Very slow vehicle. Probably had to swim around while Jonah changed his mind. But he uh, vomited Jonah into the shallow water, and Jonah went and preached in Nineveh. The old Nazarene hymn is true. He never compels us to go. He never compels us to go. He never compels us to go against our will, but he'll sure make us willing to go. <laughs> we live in a world that is presided over by an infinite personal God, not an impersonal computer. But if illustratively and analogically we can show that this is perfectly possible in terms of freedom and moral choice and divine sovereignty in the world of computer technology, how much more so is it true from the perspective of heaven and from the God who says that he is so pure that he cannot look upon sin, from the God who says, Hebrews 12, 29, that he is a consuming fire, and from the God who says, Hebrews 10, 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This is a being, not a schizophrenic or a paranoid, but a being infinitely balanced in perfection, who tells us that he is limited by his nature and restrained only by the perfection of that nature, and who repeatedly wants us to get the message that evil came into existence because he is true love. And you say to yourself, how in the world do you put those two ends of the spectrum together? Evil and true love. It's very easy once you stop and think from heaven's perspective. The Bible declares, he that loves is born from God because God is love. Now, in the beginning when Satan served him, before he fell from his exalted position, and you can read this for yourself in Ezekiel and also in Isaiah, Satan was a being who had a unique position as the covering cherub. It is said of him that he walked in Eden among the stones of fire, that he was privy to the garden of God. It was said of Lucifer, that he was son of the morning, radiance in the presence of God, the reflection of that glorious presence. And he said, I will be like the Most High God. His ambition, a lofty one indeed, was not to be God, but to be like him, to imitate him. He is still trying. The scripture says, He was hurled from the pinnacle of glory so that now He is outcast of the cosmos. God surely knew that Lucifer was going to rebel against Him. 
he surely knew that this angel would one day turn and say, I will not. Yet he created him and those who would follow him and myriads of angels and eventually a race of men. Knowing all of this. Why? Because the scripture says that God wanted fellowship with his creations. He wanted a real love relationship. Love cannot be willed, nor commanded, nor superimposed. You never take your girlfriend whom you are proposing to and have the ring hot in your pocket to slip on her finger and say to her, you will love me. Now try it sometime and just see how far that kind of reasoning will get you. No place because you do not compel the object of your admiration to love. Love develops out of a desire on the part of an individual motivated by free choice. Without it, there can never be love. God created Satan in the sense of being a glorious angel along with all the rest knowing full well in advance the risk that would be run the moment that you create something lesser than yourself and you don't make it a robot. You see, true love came from the angelic realms toward God because they had the power to choose. True love comes from man towards God because you and I have the power to choose. Now I'm fully cognizant that at this juncture we will hear roars from some areas of ultra-Calvinistic theology. I'm aware that we will hear the old argument that whatever God foreknows, he foreordains. Therefore, there's no such thing as knowing about it without having set it in motion. I feel sorry for people who reason this way. Because if God did it this way, he becomes inexorably the author of Satan's acts and he cannot send him or any of his followers to eternal perdition justly for doing what they could not help doing because they were ordained to do it. Oh no. There had to be a response to him that was truly free in order for true justice to ensue. And the angelic realm said, I will or I will not. God's love was willing to endure the fall of Satan and his angels. He was willing to endure the fall of mankind because out of angels and men there would arise a core of beings who would truly love him because he first loved them. And this would be an eternal love. Now, there are those who say, well, if that's true, what guarantee do we have that now that we love him and after we go into glory to be with Christ, that we will continue to love him or that angels and men won't rebel against him again? The answer, of course, is almost immediate from Scripture. You are not your own. You have been purchased with a price to glorify God in your body. And once you have committed to him, even as the angels committed to him, what you have really done is to surrender your will in decisions of the ultimate to his decisions. And that is the whole meaning of the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We will never fall throughout all the ages of eternity for we shall be like him, we shall see him as he is. Begotten of God, sons of God, redeemed with a price. Our wills united perfectly with his will. Not because we were compelled to do it, but because we responded freely. 
to love that was beyond all comprehension. So when God speaks about loving men and loving angels, he also speaks about the ultimate solution to evil. Evil is because angels and men chose. Evil will continue because it is God who is working out through freedom and moral choice his will for those that love him. And in the end, in the final analysis of it all, it will come full circle at his throne where there will be those men and angels who have responded to a love that will never let us go and from which we will never ever will or desire to be severed. So as we approach the problem of evil, the Christian can approach it in this context. The Christian can understand that from God's perspective he has put up with us because in the end he expects to turn even the wrath of men to praise his name. I'll never forget on one program I was discussing this subject and one of the men said, You mean that God is letting all this go on though he can stop it any minute? Anybody that lets something go on of that magnitude or anybody that permits people to suffer, that allows people to be executed, just take the gas ovens of Germany, that permits them to be executed and has the power to stop it and doesn't do it? You can't really believe that that's a good being and a just being. Now, I looked at the man for a moment and I said, tell me something. If a policeman in New York's Spanish Harlem is driving along in his prowl car and he rolls the window down and looks out because somebody waves at him to make an inquiry and somebody sticks a 12-gauge shotgun in the window and blows his head off and his partner's head and splatters him around the inside of that car, what do you think ought to be the action taken against that person? He said, I don't see what this has got to do with it. I said, well, I'm really interested, just from a point of inquiry. He said, well, you already know, he said, in New York State, if you kill a policeman operating in the line of duty, you're to be executed. I said, really? I said, tell me, how many people are there in New York State? He said, oh, I don't know. I said, well, there's at least, at least 17 or 18 million. Yeah, what about it? I said, they're all cruel and inhuman beings. Because when that man comes to trial and he is sentenced to die, they have the power to force the governor not to kill him simply by registering a vote. But none of them do. So corporately, every time a man is executed or a woman in New York for crimes of this magnitude, every person that does not exercise their right to prevent it is cruel, unjust, and inhuman. He said, I don't agree with that. I said, well, I can't understand how it's possible to take us off the hook and leave God on it. For that's exactly what we do. If God interferes in our world and stops everything right now, man becomes automaton because only a sovereign decree superseding all human rights of choice can halt the evil which was within our nature exercising itself. But if he chooses not to do that and permits us to go on with evil, then we raise our voices and our fists to heaven and we say you are cruel and inhuman and unjust because you have the power to do it and you won't. Either way, God can never win. If he interferes, we are robots and we are no longer free and we protest. And if he doesn't interfere, he's guilty because he doesn't use his omnipotence to stop it. Our solutions never work. That's why we must look at it from the perspective of heaven. 
God's solutions consistently work. And his solution is very clear. An almighty deity decides to allow free moral choice in his creation so that spirits and men may be truly free to love him rather than robots who reflect only his will by being programmed to respond to his stimuli. By definition, the deity is beneficent. Therefore, by allowing freedom which he, which produced evil, he is at once all-powerful and good because he causes the evil that arises from free choice and will from men and angels to work out his perfect sovereign solutions for mankind. You recall that I said in the beginning, either God is good and not all-powerful, which is what John Stuart Mill and H.G. Wells and Brightman and Bertocci and others have said, or God is all-powerful and not good. Therefore, God, by definition, is either finite or he is an all-powerful despot or he does not exist. All of this has been answered in the light of what we have seen of the character of God as revealed in Scripture. God is good and all-powerful. He is not finite and he desires that love reach its ultimate goal. If through the stages of reaching that goal it is necessary for there to be sin, suffering, pain, and death, it is our choice that they are here. And it is his grace that as he chooses delivers us. But however we look at the problem of evil, it originated from free choice and it is governed by love and programmed by sovereignty so that in the end God will be declared altogether holy, righteous, just, and good. And before his throne every mouth will be muzzled. And at the name of Jesus every knee will bend and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ taught us that his Father was not only perfection, but that he cared for the sparrows, he cared for the lilies of the field, and he cared much more for us. The evil that the world has was described by Jesus Christ in these words. Woe unto the world! because of offenses. For offenses must come. It is inevitable. We are living in a universe paralyzed in many aspects by sin. And I conclude with this thought. How many of the people who approach the problem of evil ever personify it? How many ever stop to think as our friend on the radio program had to stop to think, that every solution they propound to it ends in disaster and with the annihilation of life, as we know it. How many ever really ask the question, if there is a problem of evil, is it not fiercely personal? Am I not myself involved in it? And if so, what is the ultimate solution for me? The Christian alone has that answer. Jesus Christ, infinite holiness and perfection, bore in his own body our evil on the tree. The just for the unjust to reconcile us to God. Love began the universe. Love permitted freedom. Love tolerates evil. Love programs redemption. Love will supervise judgment. And love will in the end conquer all. 